Mark Branley from Ferris State University. It's a pleasure to have you here. You're also an adjunct scholar with the Mises Institute, having come up through uh, Auburn University. Before that, you were in the oil industry. It's true. And you've written an article about how to reduce the gas price, uh, which I f I'd read just this morning and thought it was fabulous. I wonder if maybe you would uh, want to talk about that. Uh, yes, every time the um, every time we see the gas prices go up, we hear, particularly government officials and the attached media, blame speculators and oil profiteers and evil Arab states and uh, right. <laughs> people like this, and they completely absolve themselves of any blame in this uh, issue. Although, even though they've spent decades uh, uh, implementing policies that, that appear to be aimed at helping OPEC maintain high oil prices and at uh, at uh, harming gasoline consumers. Yes. So first we've got a tax, right? Yeah, we have the tax on the direct excise tax on gasoline. Uh, a large part of the price of gasoline is taxes, but there's a direct tax right at the pump. And it's a tax of, uh, I think it's 18.4 cents at the federal per gallon at the federal level. But... Uh, the state taxes on average are even higher. And um, the average excise tax is close to 50 cents a gallon. I think it's 48 cents a gallon. So. Yeah, so I mean, just eliminating those taxes would by itself trying to... Yeah, almost all that tax ends up being um, uh, resulting in higher gasoline prices. So it's almost all shifted onto the buyers in the form of higher prices. And eliminating that tax would almost, uh, would immediately or very quickly uh, reduce the price by close to 50 cents a gallon. So. Yeah. Um, now, uh, then, of course, you have the, the um, supply considerations, too. <laughs> yes, many of the policies uh, have the result of restricting oil production, in, in which case you end up with uh, higher oil prices, and which lead to higher gas prices. 68% uh, of gasoline prices, it's estimated, are made up of oil prices, mm -hmm. oil costs. And... Um, uh, before I talk about the policies, I'd like to mention that the tremendous hypocrisy here of uh, our government officials always blaming OPEC officials for restricting oil production in order to ma maintain a high price, while they implement policies to restrict our production, right. which mean, which increases the price of oil. And uh, this this is it's I always find this stunning. That it's a, a kind of case of um, how do you say projection. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> too, too different to the discipline of psychology or dated psychology or whatever. Exactly, yeah, that's exactly right. right. But this, you know, I don't think they have a blind spot. I don't think they believe their policies are not doing the same thing. I mean, their policies are directly aimed right. at restricting the right. production. So Right. Well, and in addition to that, you've got um, also a political, very lively political movement out there that believes we should no. be consuming far less gas and, and driving up the price precisely for that purpose, right? Sure. There's a almost a war on the car here that, uh, that uh, you know, the, the car's this is moving into philosophy. It's almost a symbol of freedom that we get right. to drive around and do whatever we want. And do you recall it was early in the Bush 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 years? Uh, David Frum was taken on as a as an advisor to the White House, and uh, mm -hmm. he said uh, uh, in one of the first meetings he had with with Bush, you know, one thing we could really do for the American people is drive down the price of gas. And, and Bush's response was something like, "Well, that's what do you mean? That would be crazy. It would cause people to 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 drive more, and that's the last thing we need." <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Bush said something like, "Our problem is cheap." Uh, energy prices. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't really about conservation. It was about the price of gasoline. It was really troubled him that it would fall. Right. Uh, um, early on in the Bush administration, the price was about $30 a barrel. And then it started to fall early on. Yeah. Got, you know, they thought, well, we thought, well, it might get to $22 or something a barrel. And, yeah. and Bush said he, he immediately needed to stabilize oil prices, which means keep them high. <laughs> right. And so he, he ordered a a significant amount of oil to be purchased to uh, millions of barrels to be put in the strategic oil reserve. And Ch Cheney had his own views about what the price of oil, price of oil should be, as I recall. Um, I mean, he 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 thought it should should uh, it should be more or less in this range. It shouldn't be this, and it shouldn't be this. It should be more or less right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he did. But this goes back uh, the uh, the uh, uh, 
Secretary of Energy under Clinton also said he knew what the right price was. Right, right. But it, but wasn't weren't prices in, under the Clinton years just about as low in real terms as they've ever been? Yes, they were very low. Well, the, the, uh, OPEC's power collapsed in the early 80s, yeah. and we had low oil prices until 1998. Right. And then um, I've been trying to read about this, but... Uh, in the in the 2000 election, Bill Bradley was accusing the administration of uh, driving up oil prices directly. Uh, the Secretary of Energy was uh, Richardson. He in 1998, I think it was, he met with OPEC officials, and Bradley was alleging he told them to get that oil price up from ten dollars yeah. a barrel, and it took about 12 months, and a, a, only a five percent reduction in OPEC production created uh, it, it tripled oil prices over the course of a year. So. And the restrictions on domestic production um, are egregious, just egregious, right? Yeah, I think so. There's well, there's direct restri restrictions where it's just we're not allowed to drill. Yeah, we the oil industry is not allowed to develop uh, areas where we know there's a lot of oil in uh, the outer continental shelf. Uh, the government claims to own the uh, the uh, what do they call them? The uh, flooded lands, I think they are. And, up to 200 nautical miles offshore, and then they say, since we own them, we we can. We uh, the government says we're just not going to let you drill in certain areas. And in the oil industry generally, there's just a, a entrepreneurship has just been just cut off completely. I mean, if I, if I wanted to let's say I woke up one day, I thought, you know, I think I would be a very good oil entrepreneur. I'm going to start a new company. You know, like it is in software. Here's my startup. Here's my oil startup. Possible. Well, it's very difficult. It, even 30 years ago, it was fairly straightforward. There was a lot of small oil companies, and uh -huh. yeah, you could you could uh, uh, acquire investors and, and just start with a few, a very small uh, uh, company, and build yourself up. And, and uh, I, I knew people that did this, and um, uh, uh, the regulations, the regulatory apparatus, is really strangling the small companies. So. Uh, the larger companies tend to not complain about these regulations, right. and we need to speculate about why, but it seems apparent this they end up with most of the oil production. Right. So you, you've got, a, 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 in some ways, a cartelized oil industry, even though it's private in some ways. In some ways, yes. Yeah. So you've got the, the handful of oil companies that are, grow bigger and bigger and never really face that sort of competitive pressure. In any case, there's not that much room to innovate either because of the regulatory apparatus. Yeah, when I was in business, I found myself spending, uh, once I moved into the office, I found myself spending about half my time trying to get oil and gas out of the ground and about half my time dealing with government regulations. Yeah. And you have to appease the regulators and, and fill out a bunch of forms. You know, and I was too, I was thinking about, what about um, the squandering of resources to get, to, well, get, to get around these regulations? For example, that BP case, you know, all that drilling and out, out so far in the ocean and everything, I mean... What 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 a what a misallocation of resources when you could obviously be drilling in uh, places that were, are much more accessible and much cheaper. No, I think so. I think that that uh, uh, the I think that's exactly right. Why are we taking these risks? Why are we doing this risky drilling? When uh, 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 <laughs> and one reason we do it is because we're not allowed to drill in, in some safer places. Yeah. So, uh, and yet there was a kind of a. Almost a sort of national hysteria over that BP situation, which seems to have fallen out of the news. What happened? Well, um, the whole th first of all, the whole tragedy was overblown to begin with, yeah. and uh, uh, the uh, I mean, we already know that oil. A lot of the oil, it's, if you spill oil in the ocean. A significant portion of it, say a third, evaporates fairly quickly because there's this light oil and it goes to the surface and it's gone. And then there are certain uh, uh, organisms in the ocean that tend to eat the rest and, and the, the tragedy was overblown. I'd like to say I, th I think that if you're going to create a spill, you should be liable for, for any damage to private property. But we go way beyond this and uh, – and, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, the whole situation was uh, completely overblown, I think. And yeah. so, well, and people make I mean, it's, it's being used as an excuse for further restrictions. Right. So, it, it's being used to to uh, further other political ends, other than simply having safe drilling. So, yeah. Well, so do you doubt? Do you have your doubts then? 
Well, let me ask it this way. What is behind the oil policy? Is it economic fallacy? I mean, surely policymakers know that restrictions on supply, uh, taxation, all the rest of it increase the prices. Um, well, I think some of them do know. If you go back to the 70s, uh, William Simon's book said he knew that when, the, when they were implementing price controls on oil and things, he said, we knew this was a bad policy, but yeah. it's just politically, that's the political uh, realities force you to do these things. Well, what are those political realities with regard to oil? Is, is the environmentalist uh, ideology so powerful that it would actually have that amount of control over U.S. policy? Well, I, I, I don't think that's the whole story. I think, I think that's a, a significant part of it. But a lot of these oil companies are multinational oil companies, and some of them have net gains if you restrict U.S. production because it raises the price of oil. And uh, I mean, uh, it's sort of, it's like you said, it's a cartelizing device. And it's, yeah. uh, so your, your net profits are higher if you... If you have less oil out there. Now, have you studied much about um, all of, all of the fashion for alternative en energies and uh, the subsidy federal government subsidies? You're trying to find any way to power our civilization outside uh, uh, fossil fuels. Well, regarding alternative transportation fuels, um, the, the laws are very destructive, and so they. If you had a purely clean gasoline, that wouldn't be good enough, because you have to have an alternative fuel. You have to have some type of ethanol or methanol, or, or you have to have electricity, or and the whole, and uh, the, the various cleaner acts and other regulations um, force you. Even if you had a perfectly good fossil fuel that was clean, that's not that's not the answer. For instance, natural gas. Most of our vehicles could be converted over to natural gas, and we have a lot of natural gas. But that's not that's a fossil fuel, so it's politically unacceptable to consider this option. But if we produce it from corn <laughs> or something, which is, but corn is not a fossil fuel. So, so then, it, then it's a, then it's a, an official alternative. Yeah, it's an official right? alternative. So it's a kind of a war on a particular uh, uh, source of energy. It's, all, of it's all about paying off politically favored groups, and, and uh, yeah. you can pay off the farmers, and you can restrict oil, which helps some of the bigger oil companies. Yeah. But it's becoming a problem in particular for the airline industry, isn't it? Because we have an industry here that's been sort of hammered uh, again and again and again. It was some wounds self-inflicted uh, with uh, the unionization and all the rest of it, and then uh, not fighting hard enough against the nationalization of the security apparatus after 9-11. After um, and uh, serious financial pressures have led to a, a growing tendency towards, I don't want to say nationalization, but sort of sort of the turning airlines into uh, quasi-public private entities, more or less. And then you get an uptick in the oil price, and, uh, and uh, they have to raise their prices, and then you get a lower, a lower uh, f a quantity of flights demanded by the consumer. So uh, this is putting a real squeeze on the airlines, isn't it? Yeah, it is, but I don't think their target is the airlines. And I think if things got bad enough, you'd probably see some type of bailout for the airlines also, yeah. wouldn't you? And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 you're, everything you said is correct about yeah. the airlines. And so, yeah. I mean, there's going to be a whole ripple effect for lots of industries if, if energy prices are high enough. This is, yeah. this is a net loss for us. But do you think that the search for an alternative to fossil fuels is, is sort of foolhardy in a way? I mean, that for the duration, as long as far as I can see, that in the end, fossil fuels can be the, the most efficient way to, to power. Well, one thing, we have a lot of oil left. Yeah. It's a finite resource, but there's a lot out there. And as the price goes up, the, recover, the amount of recover, recoverable reserves increases. Mm -hmm. So when they tell you how much oil we have, they're thinking, how much can we get out of the ground? And at a higher price, we can get more. It's profitable to re recover more oil. Uh, there's also non-conventional oil sources, and there's a lot of it. More than, there is in, more than there is in conventional sources in Saudi Arabia. So I'm thinking of things like... Uh, Tar sands and oil shale, and uh, and that's um, and there's tar sands in in Canada, and there's oil shale, and there's there's a tremendous amount of non-conventional sources. It's very expensive to get much oil out of these uh, sources right now, but a lot of the, but that's because we haven't developed the technologies to do it. 
most of, a lot of the oil we're getting out of the ground, a lot of the conventional oil we're getting out of the ground, we couldn't have recovered not that long ago. But we've developed new technologies to, to be able to recover it. And that's what I expect to happen. We'll, there will be technological breakthroughs. And, and, uh, and uh, this will give us a tremendous amount of additional reserves available. So you don't worry about this, this so-called peak oil theory or anything like that? I mean, I gather this is just a kind of a cranky view. Well, there's a there's only so much oil, but uh, I think we'll develop other uh, alternatives before we run out. Also, the, the we've been running out of oil since it was discovered in the 1800s, or since it, we started drilling for it in 1869. And the uh, uh, as early as the 1870s, uh, you started hearing in the 1880s, you started hearing we're running out of oil. And and. Uh, it was either the Interior Department or the Mineral Management Services. When it was formed, the reason was we were running out of oil, which was 130 years ago. And then around 1890, we were running out of oil, and they discovered a single well in Osage County, the Nellie Johnson in Oklahoma. And suddenly, we discovered a huge field, and we weren't running out of oil. The price of oil collapsed. You know, it's remarkable to think that that that. The discovery of oil in the sense, uh, in the modern sense, is so recent. Mm -hmm. I mean, one looks back, and you know, immediately my mind—I I was just thinking, gosh, to what extent can we credit oil with the as as the foundation of everything we know of, of as modern life? It's powered the in this age. I mean, yeah. Uh, so an attack on on oil and an attack on the capitalist production of oil is potentially very dangerous. They seem to be attacking, doing a lot of attacks that are potentially dangerous. But certainly this is, regarding powering our economy, this is a very dangerous step. It's a, it's a huge risk. And even if we know there's oil available, if, if we suddenly had a, a, a very severe problem, it takes a while to... You can't suddenly reverse everything and say, we can get to this oil. It's going to take a while to develop this. And right. So even immediate changes, immediate changes would probably have an immediate, some immediate effect on the price because the oil markets are very forward-looking. And so if we were expecting to have more oil in seven years, the people that have oil available for, for production now would tend to produce more. And so we would, we would see uh, uh, a, a reduction in prices probably fairly quickly. You've been writing a lot of articles recently for Mises.org, and they've been very exciting, uh, well-researched, and well done. Thank you for joining us here today. Thanks for inviting me.